The countryside needs road wardens more than ever, but the trails are getting overgrown, roadside shelters are desolate, and there are fewer horses to train, and not enough iron for new blades. Hey everybody, Asher here, and welcome to a brand new series. This is Road Warden, a very text-heavy, anxiety-inducing adventure RPG where choices matter. And if you've paid any attention to the channel at all, you know that I'm a fan of games that are well-written, this is definitely one of those. I am a fan of games that are made by solo developers. This is one of those, so check some boxes here already. Road Warden is a game where the world is full of intrigue and danger, and we just get to go and settle our way into there. So let's go ahead and hit the new game button here. Everyone knows to stay away from the wilderness. Most people would never risk a lonely journey. Road Wardens not only accept the struggle, they embrace it. They deliver messages, assist merchants, burn human corpses, and, if possible, get rid of beast and highwaymen. They live on the road, die young, or retire early. It is a dangerous job, but a respectful one, and it pays well. So we have some options here. We can leave the city walls, the safety there, or I still have my doubts. And look, we're just, we're just here. So if you don't want to play the game, you can just hit the quit button right there. We're going to play the game. So... There are three difficulty options. They cannot be adjusted later for reasons that may be obvious here. If you've played Warsim, the realm of Aslona, it's kind of a similar sort of breakdown here. We could do casual where you just focus on the story, no time limit, get more money. Standard, which is what we're going to do, a 40-day time limit, regular rule set. Restrictive is, well, for returning Road Wardens, maybe later on down the line, because this is one of those games where it says choices matter, and you can definitely make some choices to change the way your game sets out. So we hit the start, and you can see here we have pictures on the left, text in the middle, some statuses on the right. It is 30 minutes before dusk. The wall is still standing. There are no wolves around, and no stench of blood, good signs. This should be a place. This should be the place you're looking for. You are supposed to meet with a group of soldiers, but you hear no voices, no sounds of labor. The gate is ajar, but the camp isn't safe. It may keep away the goblins and pebblers, but not beast folk nor trolls. And the night is near. Your palfrey breathes heavily. It has been a long day. So this is how the game begins. We journey over to here and we have some options. And I'm going to be doing something a little bit different than maybe you've seen in some of other series that have. We're going to be engaging in a little bit more role playing here. I have a specific character in mind that you'll get to know in context as we go through this game here. So I could just look for another shelter. I need to look around cautiously. I dismount, sneak to the gate to look inside. Nope, we're going to get off the horse and enter the camp briskly. So take care of yourself. If you're exhausted, you will lose vitality. Higher chance you die in combat. Sad times. Your heavy boots hit the ground and the pain of the long ride finally catches up with you. You stretch out, bringing your backs and legs comfort. And this is one of the very few typos I've seen in the game so far. All you want to do now, or all you want now, is a table, a decent chair, a nice mug of beer, and some warm stew. With any luck, your axe won't be needed here. So we approach the gate and then look at this. I love the way you're going to see a lot of details as we play through this game. You explore the world and the world reveals itself to you on the left. And the pixel art here has just the right level of detail to bring the words to life here. If it's a military camp, it doesn't look the part. Plenty of wasted space. The fire pit is cold. Two people are sitting at the table, tired and disheartened. They're looking in one in different directions, paying no attention to one another. One of them is holding a cup. So walk forward. It takes a few breaths to glance in your direction. The first person greets you with a wave of his hand. There are bags under his eyes. His beard is messy. Despite his simple shirt, he is wearing, wearing durable, decent boots. A mace with a head covered in iron hangs from his side, but he doesn't reach for it. As for the second skull, just like you, she's wearing a gamson, but hers is a bit loose as if she took it off of a corpse. Her head is shaven as if she's protecting herself from flesh-eating bugs. Her eyes are wary yet kind. She smiles. Considering the squad was sent here half a year ago, these two surely look the part, though there should be more of them. Eight, you believe. So we have two options here. 
We can let them speak first or we ask about their lieutenant. We're going to be a little assertive here. And one of the nice things about this game is that you do get these different options for things, but it tells you what you're going to say first. So we could be friendly, playful, distance, intimidating, or vulnerable. Um, I think with when we have two people just sitting here and it's near dark, we just need to get to the point. So let's just say I'm looking for your lieutenant. The woman stands up, dusts off her armor, adjusts the sword at her side, and rests her hand on the hilt. Her shoulders are straight, her eyes attentive. It'd be me, traveler. Are you in trouble? I'm fine. I'm your new road warden. <sighs> I took you for a wayfarer, to be honest. And by the way, this is something where if you want me to do more different inflection or different voices or things for characters, let me know in the comments. I'm happy to do that. But for the time being, I'm just going to try to read it straight here. When you mentioned that your mount is waiting outside, she raises an eyebrow. Shouldn't you unsaddle it? I bet it's tired. She glances at the gate, then at her companion. Her voice drops the slightest sign of wariness. I expect you'll be looking for directions. I'll help you as much as I can. She reaches out to you. Lieutenant Tulia. And I shake her hand, and we could do this. I'm, or be a little bit too embarrassed, or don't shake her hand, but this is where we get to state our name. What do people call us? Leto, or Leto is the base name here. We're going to go by Kira for reasons that you will find out. Well, I guess because it's her name. And one of the nice things about this game, I have played a little bit on the side just to get to know it and get used to it a bit. I don't think there's ever any indication or qualms in the writing that says what your gender is. So if I have if I paid attention enough to the writing and it doesn't say, then that's a good sign that you can be who you want to be in this game. Her grasp, being the lieutenant's, is confident. The shake is slight. I j just keep your horse away from the tent, she steps away. We don't need to smell its dung. Ah, uh, there is one issue. The soldier in the shirt also rises to, a to his feet. We have no tent to spare. You'll have to use a blanket or something. So, no problem. I enjoy observing the stars is the correct answer. Not that there's any wrong answer here, but... You walk through the gate. Your mount looks around and snorts anxiously. Not many humans can ride a horse. It's not only taller than you, but also bulky, as heavy as it is strong. You can get in the saddle within a single breath, but most people wouldn't know where to even begin. From every side, it's a wall of flesh. Horses were brought to the dragon woods from the conquest in the south. They can trot for a long time, but won't outrun some of the local monsters. Your uh, palfrey needs you to survive, but without it, you two would be lost. So we have two options here. We could say it's my only companion I want it to feel at ease, or I don't care how it feels. These are all characterization choices, and Kira, as you'll learn, is a big fan of animals. So, it takes a few steps towards you, scolding you with another snort. You scratch the bottom of its neck with strength and confidence, just the way it likes it. Humans see useful animals, and even pets, as monsters in disguise. Getting emotionally attached to them is believed to lead humans to their doom. But you know that horses need companionship. I speak to it gently and lead it into the camp. You end up next to the fire pit. Removing the saddle makes the horse nicker with relief. You take a couple of minutes to examine its back just in case. While the riding equipment is not that heavy for such a strong animal, with enough time it does start to, sh to chafe. You wish it had something better to eat than the shabby grass. You should look for an inn. So we start to unpack here. You haven't brought that many things, and you lost one of the sacks while fleeing the Crimson Corpse Eaters. Worst of all, you have no rope left, but maybe the soldiers here could share one. Shouldn't cost more than a dragon bone. Aside from the travel set, you own a few valuable possessions for your trade, and this is where we get to choose a class. Fighter, Mage, or Scholar. Which, I'm going to go ahead and click the you want to learn more about classes here. And I will leave this paused if you want to pause and take a look. Fighters very simply resolve things with brute force, but not every problem can be resolved with brute force. Mages use Numa, which is essentially your magic ability here. And scholars end up knowing a lot about the world, but struggle with other kinds of things that are outside of the realm of their knowledge. So interestingly, we have kind of your, I don't want to call it easy, medium, difficult for fighter, mage, scholar, but three different approaches to the world for sure, with scholar probably being the more difficult one. But Kira's choice is simple. She's a fighter. So that is who we shall be. So and you're going to hear me take some drinks of water here because there's going to be a lot of reading in this series. So opening up the inventory. I love a very simple, straightforward inventory system here. She starts with a crossbow with three bolts 
and axe. I love that all the classes start with an axe. We have our travel set, the armor, a pouch with coins, and a food ration. So we have two food remaining here. And we also have armor here. We have three out of four armor right now, so we could potentially max that. Note that we've been traveling for a while, so we don't start the game full on fresh. You unpack and inspect your belongings. Your water skin isn't pierced. The spare clothes are still here, just in case. You take a look at your wooden bowl and mug, your cape, tinderbox, bandages, food rations, knife. Nothing special or too cumbersome. From time to time, your routine helps you avoid mistakes, but this doesn't make it any more exciting. So let's return to the soldiers. They're at the table again, observing your beasts and chatting between themselves. Your stomach growls at the sight of them eating out of wooden bowls. One more bowl was put at a previously unused spot at the end of the table. You can sit down on a tree log. So we have some options here. We can join them and take a look at the meal, thank them but don't eat in front of them, or completely ignore the meal. I have no shame. Let's eat. It's called gruel, the meal eaten in times of hardship. This specific bowl is filled with water, hog millet, some strange looking cereals, and blueberries. Note that we have a food gauge over here. I know not everybody is the biggest fan of survival mechanics, but they are staggeringly important here. And there's lots of opportunities to keep yourself nourished, or if you choose to, not nourished. Welcoming you with a meal, even a humble one, is beyond their duty. Soldiers live with and for their companions, constantly on the move from one part of the realm to another, making sacrifices to protect their group as they face dozens of hideous creatures. Their lives are filled with discipline, hardship, and camaraderie. Road wardens, on the other hand, learn how to work by themselves. They seldom engage in open combat, patrolling the same roads for years. They help the settlement stay in touch, but also maintain commerce, settle down, forge friendships, and when there are no laws to follow, they use their own judgment. Different responsibilities, different lifestyles. So eat quickly and not focusing on the taste because at the end of the day, it's still cold gruel. And we'll speak with Tulia. She's focused and chooses her words carefully. She looks away only when she gathers her thoughts. I'm afraid I can tell you less than I would like to and less than I should. She nods towards the other soldier. As you can see, there's not a lot of us left. At the beginning of the summer, there were eight of us, including our previous lieutenant. Five are dead and one is run away in tears. We are also strangers in this land, adds her companion. So we're just going to ask for any information to help do the job. The man leads forward, his legs shake nervously. He sounds like a kid asking a bard to sing one more story, tell a joke, do a magic trick. Whatever it takes to escape from boredom, his untrimmed beard hides a much younger face than you originally thought. And by the way, pay attention to ages of characters in this story. There's a wild gamut of uh, details for all of these people we're going to be meeting. What did the officials tell you? I expect not that much. No soul governs these lands. So we could keep things close to the vest, and we are we are going to kind of try as we go through here to keep ourselves kind of cut off a little bit, but we can, we can be smart about it. These two gave me a meal. I can give them something in return. You tell the soldiers how little guidance you've received. Since this area is too far away from Havlavan to keep it under control, you were warned that it is untamed and unknown. Who knows how many villages, bandits, or monsters may be found in these unmapped hills and forests. From time to time, new people come here to look for boundless opportunities, and most of them never return. Do they turn into walking corpses, or do they find what they're looking for? No soul could tell me, so I was looking for your guidance. The lieutenant drinks from her cup and crosses her legs ankle on knee. Seeing her chair makes you doubt she'll ever find a comfortable position. Where should we start? And you see, this is great. We have all kinds of questions to ask. Did you want text-based RPG? Because that is that is what we're getting in Road Warden here. Note that we have to ask some questions here to continue on the journey. We need to ask about the peninsula, the Road Warden, and the rope. So let's start there. What do you know about the peninsula? I'll tell you what I know, and you'll be the judge, says the lieutenant. How long did it take for you to get here from the city? On a decent palfrey, I guess it would be three or four days. When you confirm, she continues. From here, you can reach the coast in about a day, as long as you don't make any stops. Do you know the situation? Why no ships can get here? You nod. The sea route allows Havlavan officials to keep in touch with the coastal villages, collect taxes, move the soldiers, collect lumber, deliver tools, but maintaining order on a wild coast such as this one is like filling the ocean depths with coins. Because of the rocks, you can hardly stop a ship five miles from the shore, and the boats can't get much closer. She nods. I don't know much about fishing, but there's not that many people living by the shore, and they don't crave to stay in touch with the city folk. 
She pauses. Her companion carries on. No soul in the north ever came to the camp, but when we travel to the roadside inn, Pelt of the North, they're happy to trade and to play dice. Well, why not stay at one of the settlements? The man clears his throat. <clears throat> I mean, you know. We're to guard this road. To ca This camp is our post. And well, he turns toward Tulia. She lowers her voice. Don't take this the wrong way, Kira, but are you a devout soul? And this is where, once again, if you want to read all of these, we have options here. There are multiple faiths to choose from. The United Church, the Order of Truth, just a regular sort of fellowship that's not tied with one of these. Actually pagan, but Kira... Kira is not a religious person, so there's no evidence of the rite's existence at all, and the mystical tales are explained by magic. So, no, I'm not. The man nods. I heard that most road wardens drift away from the churches. It doesn't matter to me, neither of us, I think, adds the lieutenant. Peeping at her companion, I just I just wanted to make sure we wouldn't touch on a step on a touchy subject. You won't. Go ahead. The people here are disquieting. Every few words, she taps the table with her finger. Their traditions. They won't help them negotiate with the officials here. She starts to draw lines with her index finger as if she's pointing at an invisible map. This peninsula is connected with roads, like a big circle. In the northwest, you'll find a weird village at a bog. It's not exactly pagan, I don't think. It even has a priest who claims to be an Aramite. You nod. She means the fellowship. They do crazy shit, her companion chirps in. They use the dead to cut down trees and dig in soil. Once I saw it, I begged to never return there. I see. Well, that's that's about the only answer you can give. Um, you heard tales such as this once since you were a child. If an isolated settlement manages to survive without a city's influence, its customs and traditions grow more and more alien. Every generation learns how to adjust to the dangerous conditions they have to deal with, and the rustic pagan traditions muddy their faith. The United Church often warns its members about the crazy druids, necromancers, the blood mages, the bringers of doom, the traitors to humankind. And we have an opportunity to follow up with some questions here. Do we want to talk about the necromancers right away? Let's talk about the necromancers. They open that can of worms. Let's dig in. You can see why we're not eager to go back there if we could avoid it, the lieutenant chuckles. Maybe <laughs> maybe they'd be more welcoming to a road warden. The roads are dangerous with little to no shelters. People need your help. The man in the shirt turns and points a finger to the northwest. If you're heading to the undead village, you'll get to an end first and soon. Tully and Oz, the pelt of the north is a safe place. You can talk with the innkeep or the guards. Ask them about the road. So let's talk about the east then. She stares off across the camp. <sighs> Hard to tell. We went there only once. There are hills, forests, rivers. We saw a tunnel sculpted in leaves and branches, but we didn't enter it. Wilderness all around. So any monsters worth mentioning? Uh, anything that could catch my mount? Oh, we saw all sorts of beasts. The man starts to count on his fingers. Goblins, treants, cats large and small. Runners, howlers, wolves, spiked boars, mufflin eaters, griffins, but we, we managed to stay away. Some could catch up with most mounts, Tulia glances at her companion. Though a palfrey should be fine, the trees are so tall that the flying creatures keep to the coast of the mountains. There's not that many humans around, and the animals are busy fighting among themselves. They fight more for food than territory. The, soldiers crack, the soldier cracks his knuckles. <laughs> Don't pr pr provoke them and ride fast. Just count on luck. So that's all I need to know. And look, we have other questions here. So, any idea what happened to the previous road warden? Tulia takes a deep breath. Aren't you a little late for a rescue mission? We haven't heard from him in almost a year. The soldiers speak up for a bit between themselves, trying to get their story straight. They confirmed that he had stopped by their camp a few times, but stopped showing up at all in the early summer. The bearded soldier starts to scratch at the table with the tip of his knife without looking at you. I don't remember his voice, always busy, drowning in things to take care of. He would sit somewhere, sharpen a sword, fix his loud mail, clean clothes, write notes on that wax tablet of his. Yep, and leave at dawn. Unlike us, Asterion never gets bored. Tolia lets out a joyless chuckle. He's secretive, but some of the locals speak about him warmly. Maybe, maybe he just doesn't like us. Sounds like you're not sure if he's dead or not. Well, if anyone knows, they won't tell us. Maybe someone is keeping him in a basement. The man carves with passion. We haven't seen him on his Saurian. Something ate them, I bet. The officials have hired you, right? They don't expect him to return. Richer road wardens often use four-legged meat-eating saurians as their mounts. They have to be tamed and trained since they're hatching, but unlike horses, they can easily defend themselves from many monsters. At least your palfrey is fast and reliable and won't suddenly sink its teeth into an innocent passerby. 
Do you know what he is looking for? Maybe he left you a message. Ah, neither one of us had any insight into his dealings, says Tulia. My predecessor left me no clues. We also took a look at Asteria and said, wait! She raises her open palm. I almost forgot. She stands up and heads to a nearby tent. He has kids in a village near ha Havlvan. I was planning to take all of his things there. A pouch, a second spear, a decent bow, some potions, quite a treasure. She glances at you, but I would much prefer to bring them the truth about their father. So you want me to find out what happened to him in exchange for his stuff? Here's the catch. She dusts off the hilt of her sword. We hired a messenger to ask the commanders for further orders. Since she hasn't returned and you know nothing about her, she either ran away or something happened to her. She sighs with resignation. We are meant to stay here until fall. What do you think? Come see us, tell us what you've learned about the man, and we'll go back to Havlvan together. You think about your real mission. You're planning to return to Havlvan in the early fall anyway. If he's alive, I don't think he's going to be happy with me taking away all of his possessions. True, but he's considered dead. I doubt he'd begrudge you anything. And who knows, maybe you may just find his shell lying on the roadside tomorrow. He wears mail, uses a spear mostly, maybe five feet tall, but stout, long, red beard, short hair, pale, pale face, rarely smiles. She glances at her companion, but after he adds nothing, she sits down and stretches out her legs. So find out what happened to him. Dead? Alive? Left? Just let me know. So we have a journal here. This pops up. So we do have a quest for finding the road warden. And also, there's a lot of really good details here. As um, we'll be able to see here. We even have a glossary. Um, I wonder about some of the things like soul, shell, num uh, numa. When people are talking about their shell, they're talking about their body. So lots, lots of interesting details if you want to read that basic stuff. So I think obviously we got to get to another key question here, which is, what happened to your squad? I'd like to know more. The man shrugs. Bandits happened and monsters. A strong band, though, his companion chirps in. When we got to the peninsula in spring, we saw some people living in this camp. The lieutenant decided to avoid it and look for an inn. We had to travel through the night for a bit. The bearded soldier scoffs and crosses his arms. But she carries on. If he had decided otherwise, we would have all died that day. The innkeeper explained that the camp is a trap, and the armed ones pretend to be soldiers. Stay there at night. Lose everything you have. Which, that sounds like slave hunters. Tully sighs. Very much so. They killed some, and they took others away. Who knows where. They were letting the northerners go, hoping to avoid their wrath. It kind of worked, added the soldier. We asked them for help, but they refused. We had to clear the entire camp on our own, and that's why the three of our people died. Don't exaggerate. It's not like the lieutenant didn't make a mistake. He wanted to get rid of them and take over their camp, but we didn't know our enemy well enough. We were outnumbered, and they had an ice mage among them. She looks at you. At least we cleared the road. Saved lives. You mentioned monsters as well. Nothing that would surprise you. Those of us who survived the skirmish were young, too inexperienced to spend a summer in the place without a good leader, and they didn't trust me. One of them got caught by a tree, and another one ignored my orders to perform some sort of ritual hunt. So a werebear tore her to pieces. The last one tried to act tough, didn't tell us that he had a cut in his hand while cleaning a, his gamison, and she let out a ghastly chuckle. <laughs> we had to cut it off, and he was so ashamed that he decided to walk north to find a new life to disappear. Idiot. What a colorful journey. The man tries to drink from his mug, but it's empty. So we'll just stay silent at that one. Tulia seems defeated. Well, let's ask her if she seems sad right now. Let's make her sadder. How'd you become lieutenant? Well, that's not much of a story, honestly. She looks at her hand, which is currently rolling a mug over the table. In the city, there's a strict order of what do I call it? She exchanges looks with her companion, but he can't help her. Well... Leadership secession, I guess. Havelven chief selects commanders, those select lieutenants, and those put their soldiers in order of priority. If a lieutenant ties, they get replaced by the next soldier in line. No, I wasn't exactly in succession. When we found, when we fought the bandits, our lieutenant was hit by a slingshot. His boyfriend jumped to help him, but failed to protect either them from a spell. It was like a ball of ice that hung above them and exploded, piercing their heads, completely avoiding the shield. Really unpleasant. She paused. So you're the third one, or jumping like that to save a man in the middle of attack doesn't sound like a wise decision. It doesn't. I agree, but so what? He's dead. I bet doubt he's going to be learning from that scolding. So yeah, 
Basically, she was the third in the line, she says without enthusiasm. I don't plan to become leader, though. Or I didn't plan to become leader. I'll get demoted once we return to the city. I prefer it that way anyway. So, we have some more details here. So, I've lost my rope. Could you spare one? You're in luck. She heads towards one of the crates and moves it. This is a large linen sack revealing a rope. She brings it back nonchalantly and sits down in her chair. Take it. I was planning on leaving it behind. So, we find a rope. A regular rope with hemp fibers. Tulia leans forward and rests her forearms on her thighs, looking down with clasped hands. Then meet your eyes. I'd normally refuse, but we need some decent food. Every day I'm searching through our our groats, looking for worms and uh, putridity. We forge, but it's not a great spot. Some food rations would brighten up a foggy day. For now, you leave the rope on the table. So we have a few other questions we can ask, or we can just start the journey here. But let's find out some stuff here. What was the squad's mission? You know, the usual keeping the road safe, uh, making people be alive. So, what have they tried to accomplish? I can't really tell you. Let's just say it would be nice to have our libel outpost somewhere nearby. A place where you can always find a group of fighters willing to protect you in the name of the law. Now, if you have any other questions. So, anything else I should know about the camp? The brief story, some merchants built the camp to have an extra stop for mules and donkeys just between the inn and the southern villages. There's plenty of grass here in a pond nearby. When the peninsula grew more dangerous, the camp stood abandoned from time to time, uh, serving as a shelter for travelers. The bandits came here in the spring further paralyzing the exchange of information between northern and southern settlements. Since these highwaymen are no more, the situation may reverse, time will tell. You can sleep here wherever you want, the man concludes their tale, though don't expect to wake up without a pain in your back. So final question, if you were me, where would you go next? The soldier answers quickly, ha, to the end of course, he grabs his empty mug. The one northwest from here, if you can't afford the room, the main hall is free of charge. The locals rarely gather there, the northern road is much more traveled, mentions Tulia. But the hunters will tell you about this and that, and you'll have a chance to introduce yourselves. The innkeeper can listen and knows many souls. So how do I make a good first impression on him? She smirks. Avoid cheap jokes. Stick to the trade. Don't waste his time. Show him that you can be relied on. So it's getting late. And here's the nice part of the game is that we have a whole archive that talks about what's there, but also the journal. And the journal is very, very important. It's You're going to see it gets filled pretty quickly here through the game and you do better than Asteria and stay vigilant she winks at you shattering the mask of a soldier one more thing if i can the bearded man approaches you can you take the first watch splitting time between three people makes a great difference you think for a moment to fully rest you need a good night's sleep but these people did give me a meal so i'll do it fabulous he pats your shoulder it should be calm at least before midnight wake me up in a few hours or even earlier if anything happens so nod. You go to the barrel and splash your face with your water, and look, we have a we have a cleanliness meter here, two out of five, which makes you even more aware of just how much you need a bath. After the night, it will only get worse. Your horse is already napping, too anxious to fully lay down. So we prepare the watch. The soldier in the shirt is eager to guide you. Just observe the area. There's plenty of griffins around, though. They won't jump over the palisade, probably. Better watch out for the apes. They climb up and carry out any food they can find, and there's this one really loud were-elk. That keeps smelling the wall, though it has never tried to get in. He points to the gate. The lieutenant and I will block the entrance. They're quite heavy, so if anyone comes in here looking for shelter, better call us to help you out. And if something else is chased by wolves or anything, better to throw them the rope instead. He scratches his head. If it gets cold, feel free to make a fire. And the best place is on the watchtower. You may want to put a blanket up there or something. So watchtower. Yes, right here is your watchtower. Oh, here, he points to a pile of crates. Just climb up the tallest one. You'll have a great view of the northern side, the more dangerous side. And also, I know you're tired after all the riding. He points to the tent on the other side of the camp. I can handle a couple of hours sleeping on the ground. If you wish, you go there after me and just rest, just this once. At least I have a pallet inside. So look, we have the crickets chirping. It's the nice northern view here. You put your blanket on the tallest crate and sit down. The night is warm, but the sporadic summer breeze brings gentle refreshment. From time to time, your back aches, and you have to force yourself to keep your eyes open. The light of the moon helps you focus on the tall grasses. For a moment, you spot smaller critters and birds, but there are exceptions. At one point, you see a three-horned deer trying to challenge one another. Before they clash their antlers, a two-legged dragonling appears, leading its much smaller offspring. The furry beasts try to intimidate the predators with roars and aggressive head movements, and after a few moments, 
Both sides, right on cue. After a few moments, both sides walk away slowly, not willing to risk a fight, nor willing to admit defeat. So we keep looking around. You hear the death screams of a distant prey and the mating calls of monkeys. Runners are chasing a gray hare. A group of um, musk oxen lazily chew the grass, preparing themselves to sleep. A dusk fox is running together with a lynx, making playful screeches. Thankfully, you never have to intervene. You just sit there, watching the not-so-distant forest, trying to outlast your sleepiness. You can only guess how much time has passed. Once you feel you've had enough, you climb down and go to a tent, waking the bearded man with just a couple of words. You confirm that nothing important has happened. So I gather my things, squeeze into the tent, and use my bag as a pillow. So, sleepy time. Sleeping in a tent is not the stuff of dreams, but it's a much welcome rest. The pallet keeps the cold soil away. The moonlight saves the outside world from the eerie gloom, and you listen to your own breath and find a comfortable position. Your job starts tomorrow. So focus on the real goal of the journey here. The Merchant's Guild wants to take control of this realm. Your wandering duties are secondary. First and foremost, you need to explore the peninsula, learn about the territory, resources, and threats, get to know the locals, and if you can, convince them to consider negotiations with the Havlavan, officials and traders. Could the tribes resist the soldiers or be a threat to the priest of the United Church? Are there any forbidden practices that need to be eradicated, such as blood magic, necromancy, whoops, robbery, or slavery? So we have 40 days to be as thorough as we can. Once you finish your reconnaissance, you should speak with Tulia and return to Havlavan. There, you'll report back to your employers and get your award. In the meantime, you have your own goal to pursue. So, we could try to get extra coins so that we can help someone that we care about, get extra coins so I can retire early and live in prosperity and safety, gather enough connections to be among the local leaders, so use our mission with the Merchant's Guild to climb up in the Merchant's Guild, a very merchant thing to do. Remember it as a soul who brought peace and order to this realm, a hero. I want to help people make this region safer for locals and newcomers, or I need to find a new life for myself. I have a difficult past, and I want it to be forgotten. Which is the option that we're choosing! Hooray! And if we look here in the journal as well, you can see, find a new life! Pursue another opportunity here. So Road Warden is just a means to an end. So your half-asleep senses are catching the sounds of the wild forest. Your instincts keep you alert and anxious, though the pleasant, humid late summer air evens it out slowly. You're thinking about your goal, but you need to gather your strength. So unlike real life, we can just push a sleep button to sleep. We're going to lose some nourishment. We're going to lose some cleanliness because we're in a borrowed tent. But... It's, we don't have a choice. So you're woken up by sunlight, well rested and ready. Without haste, you gather your things. After only a couple of breaths, you notice a weird smell, like a roast. No, burning meat, burning, rotten meat. Disgust crawls into your consciousness, consciousness, and you exit the tent. Your horse is looking around nervously. Your bags are where you had left them, and you see the open gate, but it's the open northern gate. Both soldiers, are there they are, are standing near a humble pyre. The man in the shirt looks at it contemplatively, or contemplatively, excuse me. Tuli is the first one to address you. Kira, she greets you with a nod. We use the horse's manure for the flames, so don't worry about cleaning up. You see a corpse among the flames. It is impossible to tell if it belongs to a male or a female, but it was an adult. The burning process won't be over for a couple of hours. A traveler or an undead? The latter, a young one. She lacked the uh, pneuma to understand that she couldn't get inside the camp without climbing. I stabbed her with the spear from a safe distance. She shifts her weight. One more fog and she'd be a real threat. Even now, it took a couple of hits to knock her down. Sooner or later, every human shell wakes up, gaining more strength with each soul it devours and each moment it spins in the fogs. Burning the dead is not just a religious practice, it's a necessity. Soldiers, priests, village mayors, even road wardens, making a large pyre takes a lot of time, but it saves lives. Tulia called this undead a she. Most Unites hesitate to do so. Oh, and that, oh, there's a burning dead body. Time for me to leave. Running away with the reek, huh? Or running away from the reek, huh? I don't blame you. She walks with you a few steps. Find us here if you need us or if you learn what happened to Asterion. There are enough, there's enough ground here for you to rest, so safe travels. These words make you stop. An old farewell mocked in a number of songs and tales, but you hear no such scorn from Tulia's voice. You wonder how many acts of kindness like this you're going to experience in the days to follow. Probably not that many. But you see, we have 14 and a half hours before dusk. 
She returns to the pyre, and I prepare myself for the journey. You somehow miss the fact that your mount is already saddled and warmed up. You double-check the equipment, but you don't normally need to fix anything. The soldiers were diligent. Normally preparing any palfrey for a long journey takes a lot of time. You put on your gamson and make sure that your axe is tightly attached to your belt. Then get in the saddle. The palfrey knickers, ready to leave. It's time for you to go to the crossroads north from here. So... We open up the game just a little bit with the travel button. So this is the map. Right now we only have one place that is a nighttime shelter, but we can travel north just a little bit. All right, so here we are. Even at this late hour, you wouldn't expect to meet any travelers in the valley. The warm summer breeze lures you a moment forward, but the serene chirping of the birds is quickly replaced by the distracting screeches and gurgles coming from further down the path. You soon find a pack of four-legged griffins. They're larger than foxes and merge the feathers of birds and fluff and furred beasts. Each one is of different size, coat, and colors, and their temperaments are just as varied. Their fronts are covered with vivid feathers, while they have their rears have dark fur. Their wings are massive, making them impressive jumpers, but they're too heavy to fly. About two dozen beasts are yelling, brawling, and chasing each other around, blocking your path. So we have options here. You can't enter the forest blindly. If those other creatures were to chase you, the thicket would be disastrous for your horse. There are reasons why travelers stay close to the main roads as possible and why adventurers move in groups. Usually the safest approach would be to stay where you are and just wait for the pack to get hungry. It may, however, take a couple of hours and you're thinking about your conversation with Tulia. You got a lot to do and time may be of the essence. So if we have vitality points, which we do, we can use warrior training for unique interactions. Otherwise, we can take some random chances here. So we can take an axe and hurry the horse, ride fast, and should be fine, or stay here and hope that they move. What is the warrior option here? Um, I grab my crossbow. A light hit should be enough to make them scatter. Or we could do a direct threat here. Getting through them should be easy enough. So if we look back at our inventory here, we have a crossbow with three bolts. I don't know necessarily if shooting at them is the right move. I think we're just going to get through them. Initially, your horse completely trusts your guidance, though after a few more snorts, you prepare your axe and get ready to push away any griffin willing to jump on you. Once you get in the middle of the surprise herd, your mount squeals and gallops forward. The creatures in front of you flee, but others try to jump at you from both sides. You kick two of them away. And while the third one gets close, its beak lands only on your boot. The hard leather keeps you safe. You ride away and the griffins can't keep up. You still hear their screeches as your mount slows down. So don't give them an opportunity to catch up. And there's choices in the game. All, all like that. So we have achievements here. My name is Kira and I used to be a fighter. Now I'm a road warden. So now we're at a crossroads here. The road splits according to what the soldiers have told you. You may find a safe haven by turning left. The forest to the right is lush, tall, overgrown kids. Used to have this song. How did it go? The harshest path always leads to the dragon's lair. Those who search for treasure, do you truly dare? The signpost in front of you doesn't make your situation much clearer. It was put here by someone who can't write. For folks who can't read, covered in old red paint, it points east. Blood there, as people say, danger to be found. There's not a soul to ask for guidance, so we ask the horse, who Sodol's a fine name. Sodol is peaceful as you stroke its mane. Maybe it can't help you choose a path, but you've spent many years together. Happy to go on, it takes a couple of steps forward. You stop, spot a few berry shrubs and wild cabbages, but they still need at least two weeks to gain maturity. Interesting, we may be able to get some stuff later. We're going to do something fun. Let's do a quick save here. And we're going to travel. So we have... Explore west or explore the way that I was told absolutely not to go. The curvy road east is overgrown saddle trots where it has a chance, but more often it walks forced to jump over larger branches blocking the path. The nearby lake is surrounded by thirsty wildlife. I observe the dark forest ready to react if something jumps at me. So we're at the danger woods and look, it is a weird chapel. A couple of stone slabs were turned into a hut-like shape. The ancient chapels raised by the priests of the United Church in the days of few soldiers and even fewer shelters. The dolmens proved to be especially durable, though their conditions they offered were harsh. The entrance is barely wide enough to let you walk in. It was meant to keep larger beasts away, including your palfrey. You can't spend the night here. So. 
Before we enter the chapel, let's look at the hourglass that's here. It's the most common religious sign of city folk adapted by the United Church that orders the truth in the majority of fellowships. It's used in temples during funeral rites, but also to decorate codices or jewelry. The winged hourglass portray the ephemerality of life and the rigidity of time. While possible, they're made of steel, or when possible, they're made of steel, signifying the strength of humankind's determination and innovation. Oh, there's that determination word. So I'm not a pious soul. I'm standing in front of the hourglass. I feel nothing. Saddle is listening, is it listening to the leaves carefully? So we enter the chapel, and here's inside. The beams of life get through the gaps between the rocks, but you can hardly see anything. A torch would fill this place with smoke, but a candle will suffice. You wonder how many travelers have sat in this cold rock, observing the entrance and fighting with their heavy eyelids. So if you look around, what are you looking for or paying attention to? Let's check here. Even though part of the ground is covered with a single massive slab, there are parts free of any flooring. You see soil, small rocks, and sand. In one spot, you see the remains of charred wood. Let's type charred wood. Okay. Um, an old campfire, not more than a couple of months old. You see dust, burnt bones, and wood. The wall above the spot is covered with soot. Let's look at the soot. You know, sticky, sticky soot on the walls. Parts of it cover black marks and pictures, possibly letters. So see, we're revealing more details here. If we look at the letters, a large part of the wall is covered with engravings. It's difficult to figure out what they are meant to portray, but one picture is obvious to you. A long arrow pointing down. Part of the writing, as well as the nearby wall, is covered with soot. So let's look at the arrow. A large part of the wall is covered here. All right. Any other writing? So it's saying to look down. Ground under arrow. So that's that for the moment here. This is something we can always return to later. So it all is leaning against the wall napping. We have a little bit of time left. So the nice thing is that this will be here. And if we go further east, I'm curious about what will happen. We're gonna hit, we're not gonna quick save before we go anywhere here, but there is danger to the east, and I'd like to know more. So the neglected path barely finds any space among all the hills, trees, and streams. Oh, I hear different music. There's a deer in the ground lying in a red puddle, surrounded by a small pack of creatures, which, which notice your presence quickly. There's about eight of them with thick furs and shades of brown, gray, and black. A hairless face with small eyes and large mouths currently stands by the blood of their prey. Some of them move on all fours, while others comfortably stand on two feet. There are two or three heads shorter than you, but it's your mount which truly towers over them. And you see how a couple of beasts take a few steps back, grunting and glancing at one another. One of the grave first shouts, and the others move towards the rocks, and sticks which are piled on the road. They hold them awkwardly, and some struggle to maintain a straight posture, leaning on their new weapons for support. Then almost all of them spread to your left and right, blending in with the shrubs loudly. Only two of the apes are standing still. So, we have a pack of goblins. So we can try to take them on here. Sotal tries to turn around, but loyalty loyally follows your directions here. So we can charge at the goblins, scream at the pack, load crossbow, throw them some food, make a few threatening swings. Um, what are our force options here? There's no time to load the crossbow. Won't be able to keep the horse safe. They're going to surround me soon. It's time to act. Let's charge. Your mount speeds up, though it doesn't have enough space to enter a gallop. You prepare your weapon, but while you may have hundreds of hours strength behind you, hardly any of them happen in the saddle. You do your best to focus. Your goblin attempts... The younger goblin tends to stop your horse, but the strike it receives sends it to a nearby bush, screaming in pain. The gray one, however, manages to grasp your boot, is now trying to keep up with your speed. Making one long leaf after another, the first swing of your axe was unable to reach the target. A spear would do better for this scenario. We're going to aim for the head. A lucky swing with your axe hits the skull, not only crushing the bone, but also pushing it out of your way. It rolls over the road and your mount runs faster. Still riding, you shake the blood off your blade. Your leg is free and the road is clear. So we ride as fast as we can and for a few moments you hear the angry shouts and screeches. But soon it's again only you and your mount. Time to see what's going on down the road. And here we are. Oh boy, there's a fallen tree. A round pied tree blocks the road for a wayfarer. Walking over thin branches on top of is not much of an issue. Even Sodal, led by a rope, could walk around the stump. But a large wagon couldn't move 
onward in one piece, at least not without detaching the mules, unpacking all the wares and moving everything by hand. That's a that's one of the very few typos I've seen in this game. Cutting a tree into pieces would take hours, even with proper tools, and you can't hope to move it with just the muscles that you and your mount have to offer. So we can't get rid of it by ourselves. It'd be a decent spot for a fish trap. We could wash ourselves in the river. Let's take a quick look around. You know, if I'm looking at the time here, we do have some options for the tree, the stump, the tracks, the wagons, the river, the bushes, and everything else. And we also have the map here. I think I'm going to go ahead and stop here for the moment. Like I said, this is Road Warden, and we do have some interesting things to start with. You'll notice here that I was told to go west, and we've gone east. That's going to be a theme here going forward. But at least so far, we've survived with our use of force holding us in here. We have some time left. So definitely leave your thoughts in the comments. Tell me what you think. If you've played the game yourself, by all means, tell me your experiences. Although try not to be too spoilery because I haven't actually completed this game and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of mystery and intrigue to investigate. So thanks again for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll be doing more of this soon. You all take care.